Democratic Alliance leader John Stiena isn't back in the news, not surprising. He's probably going to be pretty much for the next uh, 15 or so months. Yeah, absolutely. Runway now to election 2024, obviously all eyes on that election. And as I said earlier this week, a real generational fork in the road for South Africa. Um, some tough choices that have got to be made about where we're going to be as a country. And we'd like to be there guiding the, towards the right choice about the road we want to get onto. It's very tricky for you right now because one doesn't know what's going to happen after the coalition or what coalitions there'll be after 2024. But uh, certainly the news that was put out earlier this week that you're considering coalescing with the ANC has got a lot of people hunt under the collar. What, what is the actual story? Yeah, so it's, I think that the, the comments were taken completely out of context. And let me just start by saying I've spent the majority of my adult life uh, from my days as a councillor in Durban, opposing the ANC and trying to remove them from office. So uh, I'm not about to start you know, propping the ANC up. What I did say, however, is that post-2024, working back from the nightmare scenarios for South Africa, nightmare one, ANC retains a majority, although slightly, and continues along the same path. And as I said in the interview, we're going to head towards the same sort of desperation you saw by, by Zanu PF, more radicalism, more attempts to... Uh, be populist, and I think that that would be dangerous for South Africa. Nightmare scenario to the EFF and the ANC tie up, and then we're on the fast track towards Venezuela, Zimbabwe, many of those other countries. Um, so we've got to see those two nightmare scenarios and work backwards from there. And the point I was making is that we're going to be faced with a number of choices where we're going to have to take the least worst option, and that would be to be determined by where the chips fall in that election. How many votes did the opposition get? Are we able to form a voting block at the center? If you currently stack the opposition party's share of the vote on top of each other, it doesn't take you to 50%, even if you include the EFF. There is going to have to be some talk about configurations and how we get over that 51% mark. Because what you don't want to be doing is like we've found ourselves in Ekoleni, where you're governing as a minority and living from council meeting to council meeting. It's not sustainable. I also think we need to look at how we build stable coalitions. I think the worst thing for South Africa and our economy would be to have the instability that we've seen playing out in Joburg and Chwani and other places on a national or provincial stage. I think it would be very difficult to attract investors or set uh, the right investor sentiment for South Africa if that instability is allowed to perpetrate. So I just said that what we need to do is to, to wait to see where the chips fall and to make the best decision for South Africa, how we build a stable government to drive the reform agenda. I listened carefully to the interview, and there were two things that I'd like you to clarify. The first one is you said that you've been given pressure by the business community to get together with the ANC in some way. Now, you've got to wonder which members of the business community would be thinking along those lines, perhaps only those who are benefiting from the status quo. No, it's to people who are wanting stability. I think the big thing for business is the uncertainty and policy uncertainty that's characterized the last decade, particularly as we've veered between expropriation, without compensation, nationalization, prescribed assets, and there's a great deal of uncertainty. There's a lot of business people who, who are looking for the most uh, stability that they can have because the business uh, sector needs stability in order to encourage investment to be confident enough to invest in the economy. But no one's going to invest in an ANC government. Yeah. No, of course, but I'm not saying it would be, I'm not saying it would be an ANC government. I'm saying that the DA would be at the heart of an alternative government that was able to deliver... Before, before we move off there, there's been some very interesting developments within the ANC. Now, clearly, you're, not as plug, you're more plugged in than we are, mm -hmm. but uh, you're, not, you're not in the, in the body of the beast. But this Sanko election of Jacob Zuma as the mm -hmm. KZN... Chairman, do we read much into that? No, I don't think so. I think what you've got is a Senko that's factionalized and split into two factions. The national body has distanced themselves from the KZN chapter and that decision. So I don't think it's a big seismic shift. And I think it's, I mean, it's, there's something odd about someone being a former president and then becoming a provincial chairperson of a, a relatively insignificant minor body. But you, we're both from KZN. Yes. We know the Zulu people are very proud and they are the biggest populist group, if you take it, in, in South Africa. And yet for the second time around, they've got no one in the top six mm. in the ANC's uh, controlling body, we're now the top seven. 
there has to be something going on there uh, amongst the community which could perhaps cause a split or um, again are looking in the wrong places? No, I think that there is definitely a rift there. And I also think it goes further than the just Zulus. It's also whites, Indians and coloreds who are completely absent from the ANC's uh, top seven. Had a DA conference produced a top seven like that that was monochromatic, I'm sure there would be <laughs> people screaming from the rooftops. Um, but so I do think there is something there. I think that's why there's been a resurgence of the IFP. The IFP being very, very well in traditional uh, rural areas and in by-elections in KwaZulu-Natal. And I think that's a sense of Zulu nationalism that's being reflected in that vote. But watch the space because there is a party being formed. Um, Carl Niehaus uh, and uh, Barnabas Zulu were spotted at the Mount Nelson Hotel uh, discussing the documentation, registering a political party, and I've no doubt that a new organization is being formed into which the vanquished at the uh, Nazareth conference are going to eventually fold. And I think you're going to see some of the ANC rebels, some of the people that are kicked out of parliament, like Mervyn Dirks, etc., making their way into that particular party. And I've no doubt that either one of the Zoomers or uh, um, Kizi or some will start to become the the lead in that, and they may well make an impact in the KwaZulu-Natal environment, which, of course, would be difficult for the ANC um, to to counter. R.W. Johnson says, edge of the seat stuff, and I'm sure uh, the way things are unfolding, it, it certainly is, but you're a central player. You're right in the middle of all of this. How do you guide your own path? Where do you get your guidance from? Well, from my party. I'm responsible to a federal executive, a federal council, and ultimately a federal congress in the first week in April. And it's the party that sets the direction. And it always has been that way. Um, no leader of the DA or the DP has ever had unfettered powers. So I've got to make convincing arguments to the federal executive and the federal council, and I'm accountable to them um, for that. So they will provide the guidance that we need going into the conference and and into the election, uh, which is also why I've insisted that we have a Congress before the election. Because I think any leader who's going to be sitting around a negotiating table is going to have to have a mandate from the party about where we need to be going. And I think that direction will emerge quite clearly um, out of the April conference. So we'll know after April whether the DA is prepared to go into a coalition with the ANC. Well, I, I think you'd get a set of principles that would emerge from that, that we put on the table that would provide the guidance for those coalitions. What you don't want to do is to box yourself in when there may be a number of eventualities that may occur. Who knows what's going to happen in, in 2024? All bets are off. The only bet that's a sure bet is that the ANC are going to lose the majority. So we need to see how those chips fall. So I think you'd be very foolish as a political party to box yourself in one way or another without being able to look at all the options from the vantage point of what do we do that's in the best interest of South Africa? How do we provide stable government for South Africa? How do we help drive the reform agenda in South Africa? And that's where I think the DA has got a, a lot of cachet to be able to play. Born out of our experience at governing in the Western Cape, in the city of Cape Town, and countless other municipalities where we've had our own majority, we've built up an expertise in government. We know what needs to be done. Turning a place like Kauteng around is not going to be much more difficult than what we were faced when we took over the, the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town. So I, I think that what you want to do is to have a set of guiding principles that are the non-negotiables and then see how the situation develops thereafter and decide what is in the best interest of South Africa. How can we best serve the citizens? It may well be that other parties come forward and form coalitions, and the DA remains as the official opposition. It may well be, be that we supply a coalition of supply. Um, it may well be that we go into government. But all of that is a premature discussion until we know where those chips have fallen uh, in that 24 election and what the voters have decided they would like to see in South Africa. I guess the temptation is to get involved in government in the short term in 2024 the more rational decision might just be to get into a coalition that looks after Gauteng and uh, KZN, which do look like they're going to change in the next election. But, John, this conference in April, uh, we had the no-filter Gayton McKenzie uh, <laughs> on our um, 
uh, on, on business TV in the past week. And he said everything that went down in Johannesburg was actually because John Stienhausen is going to be challenged by <laughs> Paul Palazzi at the conference. What's well, I mean, your I take think on that? I think it's quite ridiculous. And, and if you take it from a logical perspective, uh, it doesn't make much sense. Surely if you know someone's going to be an opponent of yours, you would want to keep them as busy as possible running a very complex coalition in the city of Johannesburg. So I'm afraid for Gayton's Machiavellian fantasies, they need to remain in his head because they're not borne out by the facts. Gayton is obviously now trying to find scapegoats for his decision to hand Joburg over to essentially the ANC in drag and uh, is trying to throw up red herrings. Um, I've always knew there was going to be a competitor along the line. I've never said that I was going to be uncontested. And so I've been preparing myself, which is why I launched my campaign in November last year, I knew there was going to be a campaign. I knew ostensibly who would be standing. But you know, it makes no sense whatsoever to essentially, if that is the is the Machiavellian nature of your decision, to essentially free up your opponent to spend their time campaigning. If you step away from personal, the personalities involved, and particularly race, which you can't do in South Africa, but if you take the, what the DA has achieved mm -hmm. uh, in the Western Cape, and in the city of Cape Town, and increasingly in places like Mgeni with, with Chris Pappas, it should be a slam dunk election, mm. but it isn't. It's even the report polls say the DA will only get 27%, not only, that'll be your best result ever, mm. but the reality is on the ground, people are saying it's a white party with a white leader. Mm. Is that gonna play any part in your decision? Well, I think increasingly less so. If one looks at the incredible work done by someone like Chris Pappas in Umgeni, uh, he is a white South African, but he's delivering massively to the people in Mpopomeni. Jordan Hill Lewis here in Cape Town is a white mayor, and yet he's able to deliver for all the people. And Alan Windy is a white premier, but he's delivering incredible results and incredible life for all the people in the Western Cape. I also don't buy this narrative that you, just because you belong to a minority group, you can't uh, step into leadership positions. If that was the case, Barack Obama would never have got elected, uh, and Rishi Sunak certainly wouldn't be the British Prime Minister. Yeah, it's an interesting point that you make there, and maybe South Africans are so heartful with where we've gone mm. or where we've come from that those uh, issues are no longer going to be front I think and the big issue is going to be service delivery. Who's got the who can deliver the best services for me? Who can stop corruption, and who can start putting me at the centre of? Of the of the equation, I think that's what people are going to be looking. And that's for. what you're campaigning. And that's what we campaigned when you're saying, for. "Look what we've done in the Western Cape. Look what we've done in the city of Cape Town. It's not always perfect. We're not a perfect party, but my goodness me, the difference between those municipalities and ANC-run municipalities and this province and other provinces is a difference between night and day. And it's that differentiate and proof point that we're able to put before people. We don't." like other smaller parties going to say, well, we're going to promise this or promise that. We don't have to be in the business of promises. We can say, this is what we've done when people have trusted us with their vote. We can do the same for you. How are you going to get the South African voters to come back to the polls and say, I want what you have, for instance, in the Western Cape? And I say this because in the past week, the Economist's Intelligence Unit brought out the latest democracy index. And the terrible score that brought South Africa down was participation in politics. Now, whatever Gayton McKenzie and Kenny Koneni uh, are doing, as far as their messages are concerned, they are certainly making more, more people interested in politics. And perhaps they're going to go to the polls and perhaps we'll overcome this really bad score that we've had. Mm -hmm. But what can you do sure. in the DA to, to get to get? voters to actually so, come. So here's the thing. I, mean, I was in Kenya last year to observe their election. Uh, they were devastated because they got a 75% turnout, um, which is usually you know, upper 80s. Uh, and I was like, wow, I mean, if we could get a 75% turnout here. I think that many people have given up on politics as a solution to their problems. And I think we've got to re, uh, rekindle that connection between using politics as an arena to solve the issues that matter to you. So there's a number of things that we've been doing. Driving issues that matter to ordinary South Africans, not the usual stuff that keeps politicians exercised at night. The cost of bone and chicken into ordinary households, that is a real issue that's affecting ordinary South Africans 
across the board. We're putting on the table solutions to show people that we can deliver bone and chicken cheaper to your table with the following interventions. Same with the petrol price increase, the same with uh, social grants, all of those things. We demonstrate to ordinary South Africans that politics affects your wealth. But the big game changer, Alec, is load shedding. Load shedding is going to be one of the major issues for the election. If I look at the president's own a very optimistic plan that he put before us, even that has load shedding well into the second, third quarters of, of 2024. This is going to be an election issue, and it is a powerful issue because it has reached into the homes of every South African. Regardless of color, regardless of where they live, it has reached into their homes. And the party that's leading the way and essentially mm -hmm. out of the darkness, I think is going to have a compelling offer to put before the voters. And I think we've already started in the Western Cape, in the city of Cape Town, and we're going to have a great story to tell into that election. In one of your straight talk columns, how long did you read them? Yeah, well, <laughs> superb. <laughs> how, how long does it take you to write them? Yeah, it does take a little bit of time, and especially when you've had a busy week. And, um, you know, I've got people to help out as well. I've got a researcher in my office, Sandy van Hoogstraten, who's really excellent. So she does a lot of the legwork and the, and, the, and, the, and the research. But it's the ideas that, you know, come out of my office. How, what are we going to talk about this week? What do we think is important? But, but it does take some time. It's well written as well. Yeah. Which, Thank uh, you. As a, as a writer, <laughs> you, you know... Well, things. you know the economist writes to the age of a reading age of 12-year-old and the, the more simple and, and plain English you mm -hmm. can put it, which is why we call it straight talk. We try and put it in as simple, plain English as possible and in a way that's easily digestible so more people read it, hopefully. You spoke about Eskom's state of disaster mm -hmm. and now we have it, mm -hmm. or supposedly. No. What do we have then and, and what do you mean about a state yeah. of disaster? So we said we were talking about a, a ring fence state of disaster around Eskom specifically. Part of the problem that Eskom has is around the dodgy coal contracts that they're locked into, triple B double E, which affects the ability to be able to get the, to get the cheapest and most responsive goods as quickly as possible, employment legislation that is a bottleneck, and other huge red tape. So what our, our request was to take Eskom and exempt it from all of these red tape uh, onerous conditions because it is now an emergency and let us move as quickly as possible from point A of energy insecurity to point B of energy security. Allow ESCOM to, without having to go through these rigorous employment advertisements, bring in experts from international companies. Cut the visa regulations. Make sure that, that you can cancel the coal contracts, which are price gouging at a massive stage. Bypass the procurement and the type of dodgy procurement practices that are going on within ESCOM and allow ESCOM's executives to be able to move forward with the energy experts to cut the deal. You didn't mention what mm. uh, Professor William Gamedi said in his conversation with my colleague Linda von Tilburg this mm. week, that actually you need to also retrench a heck of a lot of yes. people. It's 60% overstaffed. And one of the, the frustrations of the current management is the fact that you've also got a board that bypasses the CEO and CFO and COO and giving instructions to staff who then owe their loyalty to the board, not to their senior leadership. You can't operate an organization like that. There's 60% overstaffed, and that 60% of the overstaffing, sadly, is not engineers and technicians and people with know-how. It's cadres that have been deployed there into the tenders and procurement, into the paperwork, into the ordering, into the checking at the Weybridge, whether the coal trucks coming through actually have coal in them, and they have, have hollowed out the whole system. So you're going to have to have a root and branch uh, clean out there. But I also don't think that you can fix ESC. I don't think you could put Jack Ma or Patrice Mutsepe or Warren Buffett in charge of uh, of ESC. The model is wrong. Now, as I think I told you the last time, it's like taking a, a donkey to the Durban July and expecting it to get across the finish line. Wrong model for what you need. I've had a few donkeys run for me in the Durban <laughs> July. But, uh, <laughs> when you go back to what <laughs> Professor Gamwedi said, it, it, it was almost a no-win situation because the ANC is funded heavily by the people who have the coal contracts with Eskom. The trade unions that are to which the bulk of the Eskom employees belong are now very important in Kosatu, which is mm -hmm. the uh, ANC's partner. And he was saying you needed somebody else governing the country to get Eskom right. Now, I'm sure that's music to your ears as the DA, but would you have the backbone as a party to be able to do that 
post-2024. In other words, to fix Eskom properly. Yes, but it's not just at Eskom. It's the entire public service. Uh, we are, have got one of the largest public services in the world and the most expensive. Our public service is way bigger than, if you want to use BRICS countries as a comparison of the of the administrations there. And it's horribly inefficient as well. So the courage is going to have to be far greater to be able to do those retrenchments. Just read an excellent book by uh, the autobiography by Benjamin Netanyahu. And the most imp- uh, important part of that book was not his time as prime minister. It was the time when he was finance minister. And if you read that chapter, the parallels between South Africa and them, state-owned banks, state-owned uh, industry, state-owned telecoms, and the breaking down of that and the, the, the um, getting away from that socialist uh, bent is what triggered their growth. So, and they faced six to eight months of rolling mass action, but they had to tough it out. And you've got to have the courage to do those things. Otherwise, we're all going to sink. And for the sake of 40,000 bloated employees at Eskom, it doesn't make much sense. So if the DA were to be elected into the position of power, 51%, say, at the 2024 election, we can expect tackling of the public sector because the country has to have that to go forward. A little bit like Maggie Thatcher. Yes, well, I mean, you know, you'll have all the, all the work screaming for the hills if you mention Mrs. Thatcher. But we've got to right-size the state. It's too big and too inefficient. I don't think anyone would really mind if we had such a blow at civil service, if you could get a passport in two days or you didn't have to queue for an identity document at Home Affairs or you could register for certain government services easily. But everything is a moribund mess. Wherever you look, everything the state has touched has turned into disaster. So you're going to have to have the courage to do that. And that's why a majority is going to be needed in Parliament to be able to get those reforms through because it's going to be met with massive resistance from the left. But we can't continue to have a bloated civil service the way that it is and the inefficiencies that have set in there. Part of the reason why we've brought our indicated deployment bill to Parliament is is to begin that right-sizing process, um, prevent and cut off political appointments into the civil service, and to start to bring the amount of money we're spending on the government itself down so we've got more money to spend on people and services and infrastructure. I had a fascinating conversation with Professor Jonathan Janssen as well in the past week, and I asked him about the future and whether he had hope for the country with all of the well-documented issues that we have. And he said, yes, because there's a lot more good people than bad people. Would that apply in the public sector as well? Would that apply within those organizations? Eskimi- I know I worked at the SABC just after uh, Madiba was released from prison. And even though there were many people who'd worked there under the apartheid government, there were many good people Mm -hmm. who were getting, turning up every day, working hard, serving the public. Do you feel that, that we have that in South Africa, but perhaps it's all being obscured? Yes, of course. And I I believe it fundamentally. And I share um, Dr. Jansen's hope for the future. I wouldn't be doing what I was doing if I didn't fundamentally believe that tomorrow can be better than today. And um, I do believe that there's nothing wrong with South Africa that cannot be fixed with them. And it's right with South Africa, uh, to paraphrase that famous Clinton uh, quote. There are good people in the South African police service. There are excellent people in our hospitals. There are centers of excellence all over government. They get drowned out, crowded out, and pushed out by the cadres who are deployed. They're not threatened by the fact that they're doing the job, they're working the hours that are required, they're not stealing. I think we owe it to them to be the at the forefront, the vanguard of cleaning up and cleaning out the state so that we can do right by them and allow a space for people who want to serve in the public service to do so with dignity and in a way in which their integrity is not compromised every day by rotters that are operating in the departments next to them. The longer you keep those rotten people in an organization, the more they spread like a cancer. And the more they, people get away with the nonsense that they do, the more people around them say, well, I might as well join the frenzy because there's no consequences. Got to clean up and clean out the rot as quickly as possible, and you've got to weed out bad individuals, and then you've got to make sure that they are blacklisted um, so that they're never able to be brought onto a public payroll again if you're dismissed for corruption, maladministration, fraud or theft. There are many people listening to this or watching this and saying, yeah, he's idealistic. It, it can't happen in South Africa. 
course it can. It's happened in the Western Cape. It's happened in the city of Cape Town. It's happened in Midvale. It's happening in Umgeni. Chris Pappas has turned that municipality from being bankrupt into financially viable. He's fixing the roads. He's weeding out the bad municipal officials. And that is the DA model. Uh, it's not idealism. It's pragmas- pragmatism, and it's possible. But people must understand, if they want a good government, if they want a better life, democracy is not going to do it for them. They've got to do it for themselves by using that vote to be able to affect that change. I want to finish off with a, a conversation that I had with Tony Leon mm-hmm. uh, this week. And he said that the DA needs to get out the vote. It needs to get its voters to go to the polls in 2024. That way it'll get the biggest share and hopefully maybe expand it. Now, there's been a by-election result today, which I, I'm, I'm sure you know only too well, mm. where the DA lost a seat to the Patriotic Alliance. Mm. But what struck me was there was only 20% mm. of the eligible voters who actually voted, and this was in the city of Cape Town. Now, I've got no doubt that the Patriotic Alliance, Gaten McKenzie, Kenny Corneri, they're going to be shouting from the rooftops that you see we can beat the DA in its backyard. Except what if the DA wasn't on the ballot paper, which talks about why the... Oh, that's interesting. Yes, there was no DA on the ballot paper. Uh, their stiffest competitor was good. It was an administrative error that occurred in the registration of the candidate for the DA where there was an issue with timelines. Um, I'm furious about it. There's a full investigation in the party but there was no DA candidate fielded there. I've no doubt that we would have retained the ward had there been a DA candidate. And the reason that the turnout is so low is that the majority of voters in that ward are DA voters and didn't come out to vote because there was no DA candidate. So actually the 20% is reflective Mm. of the fact that you didn't have a candidate. Absolutely. If you look at the results in that ward previously, I think the DA got upwards of 60% of the vote. And that would account for the low turnout. Just DA voters not having a dog in the fight decided to stay home. It's still unforgivable that we did not get the candidate on the ballot paper and we're in the final throes of a, of a full investigation about who's going to take political and administrative responsibility for what happened there. But I've no doubt, come the local government elections or if there's another by-election that would, and the DA feels a candidate, we'll whip everybody else in that, uh, that race. The by-elections have been really interesting mm-hmm. and hence uh, th- this one mm-hmm. is going to get a lot of attention as well. Mm-hmm. But when you have a look into the future... The PA came from nowhere, mm. 0.06%, I think, of the vote previously, to just under 1% in the, in the local elections last year. And by their estimation, they're going to go much higher in the next election. They are positioning themselves in many ways as being what the EFF is eating away at the ANC, that the PA is eating away at the DA. I would disagree. I would say the biggest victims of the PA have been the Cape Coloured Congress and particularly good if you, if you look at how goods vote has completely collapsed and eroded, it's that 2% residual mainly coloured vote that has been eaten into. Yes, there are some DA votes that have, uh, have been consumed in that, but by far the biggest victims of the PA's growth are good and the Cape Coloured Congress. And that's even reflected in that by-election um, where uh, good got properly thumped by, by the PA in that ward. And if I was in good now, I'd be looking at those results and doing the maths towards the next election and realizing that there's a, there's a problem on the horizon. Given what Gayton McKenzie, uh, McKenzie has done to you in Johannesburg, mm-hmm. twice joining your coalition and then leaving and now putting the ANC back into power, given what he's done in Neisner, could he be a coalition partner in 2024? He speaks highly of your personal relationship. Could, given what's happened in, in Neisner, given what's happened in Cedarburg, Given what's happened in Joburg, I would say that the, the prognosis is not good because what you want to have in a coalition, particularly when you sit around a table and sign an agreement, is some form of, well, you know, this is a signed agreement, we're going to hold to it. I've always been very clear in politics my entire career when I shake your hand and I give you my word, that word is my bond and, I will, and you can take it to the bank. I think that there's going to be a reluctance on all sides to just simply acquiesce to, to what the PA has, uh, has, how they have behaved. Look, I mean, I, I, Gates and I had a really good relationship uh, at a personal level. Um, I think he's a very personable guy. Uh, I just think that, in particularly if you're looking to stabilize coalitions, the type of treachery and, and, and backroom dealing that's gone on is not a good portent to be able to have solid coalition negotiations because I don't want to be going into a, 
into a coalition and then not knowing whether your partner's busy doing a better deal with somebody behind the door uh, and that your government's going to fall the next week or the next month. We need stability in the coalitions. That being said, as I said earlier, nothing's off the table. We've got to keep all options open and see where those chips lie in 2024 and then make a decision what's in the best interest of South Africa. How do we best serve the country in forming some government in South Africa? Last question, Port Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, that was a, a, a fascinating exercise in mm. coalitions after a complete mm. nightmare beforehand. How is that going? Yes, and I think there's a good lesson for people in Nelson Mandela Bay for Joburg. And I would tell Joburg people not to, to lose hope or despair because thieves always fall out. And I've no doubt that as we saw with the coalition of corruption in Nelson Mandela Bay, that similarly in Joburg, there is going to come a fight over positions, over tenders, over contracts, who's getting a better cut, who's getting a better deal, who's getting more attention, and that there is going to be a, another round in Joburg still. The story of Joburg is not yet written, just as it wasn't in Nelson Mandela Bay. Retief Odendahl's come in there, stabilised the government, been able to really get things moving, uh, PE and MBs on the up and up again, and tough, a lot tougher than it was before, but I think that the, the steps are being made there and it's moving forward, and um, I think it's it's going along nicely. Just got to get through the water crisis there, and um, I think that we'd be able to really see that municipality taking off again. Abeja, mm -hmm. um, uh, not PE anymore, yes, uh, and Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, Thank you. John Stianhazen Thank you, Alec. is the leader of the opposition in Parliament, and uh, that is the Democratic Alliance. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. <laughs>